You are listening to Neurosalience, the OHBM podcast. Welcome to the OHBM Neurosalience podcast. I'm your host, Peter Banatini. On this podcast, I have a really good conversation with uh, Dimitri Coleman and Vince Calhoun. And uh, Dimitri uh, wrote a editorial uh, when he was editor in chief of, of Brain about a year ago, and it was somewhat provocative uh, and pointed in its criticisms of fMRI. This got uh, uh, our attention. It sort of precipitated a good conversation that's been going on for about a year on, you know, what really are the limits of fMRI? What are the problems with fMRI? What's what are the problems of fMRI? The method but also the field. What are the good studies? What are the bad studies? In this podcast, we addressed at least some of those criticisms and uh, come up with you know, potential, not really solutions, but sort of uh, ways of going about uh, better practices in terms of doing fMRI, what we need to keep in mind when we're doing fMRI, and how fMRI sort of fits into this wider context of all the methodology for assessing brain function and brain organization, uh, both structural and functional. And uh, you know, we, we talk a little bit about the, the challenges of fMRI in terms of uh, its uh, lack of, of clinical impact after 30 years. Uh, certainly, it's good for pre-surgical mapping and other things like that, but um, but for actually complementing the state-of-the-art uh, methods in psychiatry and even neurology to some degree, uh, it's it's still not quite there yet. And we talk about maybe some of the reasons for that, but I think overall the tone of the conversation was hopeful in that regard. Uh, that we're that the field is progressing and very serious scientists are using fMRI as a tool uh, and trying to simultaneously apply it, but also understand it better. So it's a great conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. Welcome to the Organization for Human Brain Mapping Neurosalience podcast. I'm Peter Banatini, and here I interview neuroscientists and discuss their work, as well as the latest developments, issues, and controversies uh, in the field of brain mapping. Today, I'll be talking with two esteemed leaders in their respective fields, one in fMRI methodology development, and one in electrophysiology and pharmacology and, and, and clinical translation. Uh, we'll be taking a critical look at fMRI, discussing its limits and potential, and hopefully providing some clarity on what fMRI is, isn't, and what it could be, and how it fits in the, in the wider scheme of things. So my first guest is Dr. Dimitri Kuhlman. He's a professor of neurology at UCL Queen Square Institute of Neurology. He received his doctorate from the University of Oxford in 1984, and his bachelor in medicine and surgery from the University of London in 1986. He alternated between research in synaptic transmission and postgraduate medical training in London. Uh, in 1982, 1992, he started his lab at the Institute of Neurology. And in 2000, uh, he became a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians, uh, which he belonged to uh, previously. Uh, his interests span the fundamental mechanisms of synaptic transmission, the computational properties of small neuronal circuits, and alterations in neuronal and circuit excitability in epilepsy and other neurologic disorders. The core methods of his lab are in vitro electrophysiology and pharmacology, but he also applies con confocal and two photon laser scanning microscopy, computational simulations, molecular genetic methods, and uh, heterologous, het heterologous expression of mutated ion channels. His laboratory has contributed to the discovery of silent synapses, glutamate spillover, presynaptic GABA receptors in the cortex, human epilepsy, caused by potassium and calcium channel mutations, tonic inhibition of the hippocampus, and Hebbian and anti-Hebbian LTP in hippocampal interneurons, or long-term potentiation hippocampal neurons. 
One of his goals is to understand how phenomena that he studied at the cellular level interact to regulate excitability of small neuronal circuits. He's integrating studies on hippocampal circuit function with knowledge of how interneurons and principal cells fire during different behaviors. Uh, this is being approached both experimentally uh, and with simulations. He's also aims to apply his lab's recent insights into cellular consequences of inherited mutation of ion channels. Uh, channelopathies, or as they're, as they're called, to develop new ways to diagnose and treat neurological diseases. He was also the editor of the journal Brain from 2014 uh, to 2020, or just recently he stepped down. Uh, he brings to the table a perspective of a clinician neuroscientist who does research at the neuronal scale. So my second guest, Dr. Vince Calhoun, is a director since 2019, I think, uh, of translational research in neuroimaging and data science uh, called TRENDS, uh, which includes three universities, Georgia State, Georgia Tech, and Emory. In 2002, he received his PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, then became an assistant clinical professor at Yale and director of the Medical Image Analysis Laboratory Institute of uh, Living in Hartford. He moved on in 2006 to the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, and as an associate, starting as an associate professor, and then moved up to become distinguished professor uh, at the University of New Mexico and a director in, the very, in various forms of the Mind Research Network uh, in Albuquerque. Uh, Vince is an expert on brain imaging acquisition and analysis and has created numerous algorithms for making sense of complex brain imaging data. He's the creator of group independent component analysis algorithm, which has become widely used for extracting networks of coherent activity from functional MRI data. He was also an early innovator in approaches to characterizing the dynamics of brain connectivity. He's also developed techniques to link many different types of data called data fusion, including various types of brain imaging, structural, functional connectivity with genomic and epigenomic data. A key focus of Calhoun's work uh, is the development of tools to identify brain imaging markers to help uh, uh, reveal and pot potentially treat various brain disorders. Uh, including schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, autism, Alzheimer's disease, and many more. He's recently served as the president of the Organization for Human Brain Mapping. And, and of all the people in fMRI, I have to say he's been probably the most prolific uh, in his publications uh, and his work uh, to push methodology and, and hopefully applications of fMRI. Uh, so in this podcast, we're going to talk, our, our focus is uh, fMRI. And fMRI has been around for 30 years. And uh, as most people, most people in this audience know, it's been uh, used in many ways and it has many limits. You know, the main, one of the main issues is uh, the fact that it relies on hemodynamic responses and uh, 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 people have uh, used this technique very well for answering some very good hypothesis driven uh, questions. Uh, We've had, we've gone through many stages of um, both advancing the methodology and uh, having, you know, mild crises along the way. You know, there's a reproducibility crisis. There's been the, the you know, the uh, debacle with the dead salmon that just simply il illustrated, uh, you know, if you don't do your corrections properly, you can get false positives uh, and other things like that. And, and this podcast is a discussion of uh, uh, what, what those issues actually are in reality and also uh, how they've been addressed and how, they, how fMRI can move forward in the future. And um, this was actually, this podcast was partially uh, precipitated by uh, uh, an editorial that Dr. Coleman wrote uh, uh, to be you know, purposely provocative and, uh, and, and it was provocative, um, but it actually brought up some good points uh, that that I think are worth it, worth talking about, and that is uh, the uh, one of the main points is that fMRI is a uh, indirect measure. But is that a is that really a damning problem or not? Um, and uh, of, of brain activity, and it has low resolution, has low temporal resolution, and so on. Uh, does it limit you? Does it limit us from getting at mechanisms of brain function? Does it limit its clinical applicability? And the second has been the second. Criticism has been that you know a lot of times we rely on the statistical maps uh, uh, with fMRI as opposed to looking at the effects themselves uh, and the uh, estimating the effect sizes. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. 
So, um, so just to begin, uh, I'd like to uh, maybe start with Dr. Coleman to uh, maybe fill in where I, where I didn't fill in properly or just to express your perspective, uh, maybe not only of you know, the editorial and since then, or, but just in general of, of, of your thoughts, uh, your perspective on fMRI in general. Uh, well, well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to participate in this podcast. So I have to point out that I'm very much sort of um, going into the, into the lion's den here uh, as an outsider. Obviously, I, I'm extreme, I fully understand the allure of fMRI. It's, uh, it's an amazing approach. You know, you can do in vivo, non-invasive imaging of the entire brain and, and see it in action, and not just in experimental animals, but, but in humans. Uh, and I fully understand, uh, you know, with 65,000 papers that, that it's, it's accumulated an enormous amount of, of, of uh, uh, methodological refinements and so on. But uh, so, yeah, so in, in my editorial, it was, I have to admit, it was a rather provocative editorial because for some time I'd been writing these rather anodyne editorials, you know, in this issue, et cetera. You know, I, I never knew if anyone was actually reading my editorial. So I thought I might reach into this cave and and pull the tail of, of a sleeping beast. And, and, and indeed, I think I did wake up this beast to some extent. Um, so yes, I mean, I th you know, one issue I had was this whole question of what the bold signal is. Uh, you know, so it's, a, it's it, as, as far as I can understand, and of course, I'm hoping that you guys will, will correct me or, 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 or educate me. It, it's a, a sluggish signal, it's non-linear, it's not suited to temporal deconvolution or let alone spatial deconvolution. You can't really point, apply a sort of point spread function to try to understand what's actually uh, happening at a higher resolution. Um, and we don't really understand what it is. Uh, you know, there's obviously this general assumption that it's something to do with brain activity, but is it the activity of, new, of excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons, both? Is it synchrony? Is it the release of specific neuromodulators? Uh, you know, all these factors are, are, quite, are quite troublesome. And, you know, people, of course, will then say, well, isn't that the case for any, uh, any signal that's reporting on, on, on brain activity, for instance, the, the EEG or the local field potential or the electrocorticogram? I dispute that. I think those are really much more directly related to neuronal activity. We can sort of understand uh, in the current flow and, and the generative models for, for those electrical signals, I think are a little bit more, 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 more clear. Uh, and for instance, you know, if one can discri discriminate between uh, synaptic currents, which generate relatively low frequency signals and, and spikes, action potential to generate the high frequency signals. So, so, so in contrast with, with the bold signal, there really is, it, it, it's, it's in a way so distorted to the point of, of losing the ability to really trace activity uh, and, and processing all the way through to uh, the, the, the fundamental signal that's being recorded. So that was really my, my concern about bold. Now, of course, I'm not, I'm not gonna, you know, as I say, my editorial was, was rather provocative. I don't want to say that, that the whole field is flawed. I mean, on the contrary, you know, one can still do an enormous amount by, by, um, by and, and, and of course there have been some extraordinary discoveries for, uh, and lots of success stories, but still, you know, that was my, that was my starting point. Um, so I don't know if you guys are going to, going to now prove me completely wrong and say that actually the bold signal is, is extremely well understood, but I'd, I'd be curious to hear. Yeah. Well, Vince, Vince, uh, what are your th initial thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I would agree. I think in large part, um, the, you know, we, we, we know that fMRI is indirect. I guess what, what I would say um, is important, though, is to kind of put it in the context of the strengths of fMRI as well, which are, um, you get a very localized signal of hemodynamics, right? W whereas if you're, if you're measuring from something uh, like EEG, and, and it's also non-invasive. So if you measure something from EEG and you're doing it like at the scalp level, right? You, you do have an, an inverse model. So you have, you have a lot of assumptions that are sort of embedded there to try to localize you know, spatially the signal you do have obviously um, a nice generative model of, you know, of, of the, um, the current, um, uh, the electrical uh, signal from EEG. Um, 
but but you you you, you it's complementary, right? In, in many ways, and that that's you know one of the things that I I do a lot of is basically you know kind of making the point that there's there's really no methodology that captures everything we might be interested in, right? So this is kind of in a general sense. Um, they're all just snapshots, little windows, um, pieces of the elephant, so to speak, you know, the blind men uh, uh, kind of feeling different parts of the elephant. Um, but, but that being said, I think there has been, and, and Peter could probably comment on this a little bit too, but there's been a lot of um, advances in trying to, you know, cause the field's kind of recognized that, uh, that, you know, we want to know more than just hemodynamics, right? We want to know something about, you know, we can already do, um, you know, sort of separate the signal components into things, you know, related to blood oxygenation, blood flow, uh, you know, you know, uh, blood volume. Um, and there's, there's also um, work combining fMRI with other modalities looking at you know which components of the of, of the signal is uh, is generating a functional uh, signal, and there were some really interesting. And I'm, I'm forgetting the actual paper, but there were some really neat movies um, of, of some mouse data where they were showing kind of the the, the the signal flow from from electrical activity through to hemodynamics, and it was a very interesting yeah. and, and and localized mapping uh, between them. Uh, not to mention, there's some studies of um, looking at, at um, uh, you know, in 7G data, looking at layers, right? So input and output layers. Again, it's very, it's, it's still, you know, kind of at the threshold of, of, of getting, you know, at details, but it is starting to tease apart, again, some of these questions of what is this signal telling us, uh, you know, about, and how does it map into what we already know about the brain? Um, and I think the other thing, uh, which maybe we can get into later is, um, you know, and, and you alluded to this as well, Dimitri, it, it is the fact that it's sort of a systems level view, right? So you're, you're getting kind of the perspective of the whole brain and how it functions, which is very, you know, has a lot of potential, right? Uh, in terms of understanding uh, different aspects of, uh, you know, brain health and brain disorder and brain disease. But, um, you know, I'll just caveat that with sort of one of the challenges is, is of course, um, teasing apart which effects are sort of, you know, um, proximal to the, to the disease or disorder versus distal, right? So is it a down, is it, is it an indirect effect or a more direct effect? Uh, and there are studies ongoing to try to look at that um, uh, sort of thing, but, you know, that's an issue. And, and I would say that's also an issue with a lot of other um, techniques um, uh, that, that when we're, we're looking at, at function in particular of the brain. So yeah, I'll pause there, yeah. So. That's great. That's a good. Um, so, the, and also the, just the way I look at fMRI in some sense is, uh, I mean, it started out with, with, you know, some amazing effect. I mean, it start, it just worked. Uh, so like way back in 1991 with our first experiment, to, you tap your fingers, you, you, every single time you see motor cortex activation and uh, you see, you know, a certain percent signal change that, that occurs almost in every single subject every single time. So, you don't need 100,000 subjects for that one. Right. <laughs> and so I think it, the way it evolved is that people were amazed that it just worked in terms of at that spatial scale, at that temporal scale, at that certainty. With every subject, you know, primary visual, primary motor, it worked, auditory, whatever. And then uh, uh, they started doing cognitive functions, uh, language um, mapping and so on. And so it sort of ratcheted forward, everyone was sort of like, just simply saying, wow, this works really well. And now we're asking further and further questions. And then obviously 1996 came along and, and you had resting state connectivity uh, that, that sort of simmered for about 10 years and finally had this breakthrough um, to, you know, maybe more sophisticated processing or uh, uh, of, of looking, of being able to say, look, you know, now with resting state, you see these connected regions that correspond almost exactly with the areas that we've already mapped out. Uh, and that seem to show this regular pattern of, across the whole brain. So even though it's indirect, and we know that it's, that there, there's many caveats, as you mentioned, non-linearities, it's that the, the, the results showed uh, a consistency and uh, a, a, a segregation that seemed to correspond to what we understand about the brain already. So it still hasn't, didn't really contribute much, and then, of course, you know, going to higher resolution and, and all the way along, I believe that 
uh, what we're doing is what I think, and when I say we, I, I mean uh, mostly uh, maybe there's maybe a hundred, you know, hardcore methodologists who, who sort of are pushing the, the, the field with, you know, comparing with other modalities and things like that. Uh, and they're trying to sort of say, okay, where is it, like you said, that, where is it nonlinear? Where is it linear? To what degree, degree can we deconvolve the signal and where does it break down? Um, uh, and, and now you're getting to, you know, people doing decoding and decoding is also sort of a trick. It's sort of a proof of concept and, and it has many advantages of being able to say, look, you know, we, if we train up this algorithm, we can actually start to break apart, you know, uh, uh, what a person is 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 uh, is experiencing or thinking or whatever, and so it's sort of all indirect ways of getting at the validity of the technique and trying to push its applications, and um, and and yeah, definitely as Vince alluded to, uh, you know, with higher and, and also we've been struggling against things like large vein effects, you know, for the most part or draining vein effects. It's a hemodynamic response uh, that limits our spatial and temporal resolution. Uh, but over the years, with either uh, modulating your pulse sequence to be more specific to capillaries uh, or going to higher resolution and identifying veins in other ways, uh, where it really makes a difference, where it really uh, does have a negative impact is when you really push the resolution to layers. And so you have to really be sure that you're not looking at veins. And so there's other technique looking at blood volume. Uh, in which we can actually get at layers. And then from layers, so there have been many salt starts. Like for instance, um, and, I'll, and I'll stop in a second, uh, the, uh, people are, have been always trying to do like what's called Granger causality analysis, sort of like using the latencies to infer directionality. Uh, and that doesn't usually work because of this, the hemodynamic response is so messy. Uh, but there's other techniques that are pretty much on the horizon that is, if you get the high enough resolution to get layers, you can start to get uh, upper and lower layer activity and then start to infer output and input uh, uh, activation at the circuit level. And so that's kind of where we're at right now where um, it's not quite there, but it's getting there uh, pretty quickly at whole brain. So, so the philosophy has been, let's push the methods. Let's really try to understand how it does relate to electrophysiology. Let's try to figure out clinical applications and part of the problem is that it works so well, there's a lot of people doing it and there's a lot of false starts all over the place. And there's a lot of bad studies uh, and that's, that exists because it's so easy to generate these maps. But there's a lot of serious scientists trying to model, you know, the, model the signal, model the network effect uh, and, and really making some traction. So, um, yeah. So, so can, can I jump in there? And, sure. And, and sort of try to push you a little bit on some of the other assumptions underneath, um, you know, underlying fMRI. So, you know, you point out that you get these big signals when you wiggle your finger, when you have a visual stimulus and so on. And indeed, uh, if I understand correctly, the, the strongest signals are in the primary motor cortex and primary sensory cortices. Uh, and of course that makes sense. That's where you have um, sort of, sort of a maps. You have clear maps of the sensory space, or maps of the motor, motor, or, or, you know, motor homunculus. But can one make that? I mean, what's the justification for the assumption that there is a similar sort of modularity uh, where contiguous neurons or contiguous sort of microscopic areas are, are, are doing operations in blocks? So, for instance, you know, the hippocampus. We know that place cells coding for contiguous areas in, in space are not distributed, are not clustered. They're distributed across the entire central temporal axis of, of the hippocampus. So, so that sort of central assumption that you have a sort of modular block of tissue generating or underlying a computation sort of rather breaks down as soon as you get out of the primary sensory and motor, motor areas. Well, it, it, uh... I would say that it, it, it still seems to hold in, you know, people have mapped, have, have done parcellation, for instance, based on resting state of the entire brain. And, and so uh, it, it seems to hold at the spatials. I think it's more, it's more a level of spatial scale uh, than system. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, there's, there's dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. It's clearly activated during working memory, but you're absolutely right. As you get, in certain systems, especially subcortical, um, uh, 
or maybe other systems that the higher and higher resolution you go, the more uh, heterogeneity you, you get in your distribution of your you know, neuronal firing. And yes, it, it below about uh, on the order of a millimeter, uh, it, it gets hard uh, to, to uh, delineate uh, uh, easily the function. And, and yeah, our big assumption is that if you have dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, all the neurons are firing in a certain way, even going to layer fMRI. We did a recent study with dorsolateral prefrontal cortex at layer fMRI, and you can differentiate the layer activity of working memory versus uh, executing a task related to working memory. And so there's differentiation. So the higher resolution you go, the more differentiation you get. Um, and yeah, uh, there are very clear limits uh, in which and I, I don't think that, and I really don't think that in the, the studies, there's an assumption that everything is homogeneous. There's just simply an observation that it, it looks like it's consistent uh, at this spatial scale. Uh, but to be able to make a statement about the, yeah, like place cells, I don't know if we'll ever get at place cells with fMRI. And, and that's an interesting question. So if we can't get to place cells, is it, is it, it is limited? but does it limit it in terms of its clinical efficacy, efficacy in some ways, or is it limited in our deriving principles of brain function? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I would say that, um, uh, that, that yeah, so, so I think Dimitri, you're kind of talking about, okay, um, yes, we can, we can clearly get parcellation, functional parcellation with fMRI. We get these very reliable, you know, maps, and this includes, uh, you know, higher cortical areas. It includes, you know, these, these sort of functional networks that we find, right? And so basically what that is, it's just signal, fMRI signal that's coherent, right? That, that's, that's, the ob that's what we're inferring from. Uh, and, and so then the, I think the, the real question, you know, in, in terms of getting at, you know, is, is what's underneath, right, at a different scale or with a different, you know, view of, of the brain. And, and, and so this is where, we have a challenge because it would be really awesome to have a way to, to, to sample at a fine grained level from an individual brain while doing fMRI or, you know, so, um, uh, you know, getting at some of those, um, uh, you know, fine grained level information. I mean, we've, for example, looked a little bit at, um, uh, I mean, it's, it, once you have that, data, if you had the data, right, you could start to do that mapping. And you can do that in some, some very limited ways right now. So, so for example, if you have EEG signal, you know, from, you know, e either, um, uh, you know, an, an epilepsy sort of, you know, surf, you know, a brain uh, EEG or, or scalp-based EEG, and you have fMRI, you can start to, to look at what networks that we see in fMRI are reflected in certain information that we can measure with EEG, right? And, and how does that tell us, uh, what does that tell us, you know, about, about those, those networks that we're observing? And so that's, there's a lot of work left to be done there, I think, because it's, it's but, but I think that there's also a lot of potential because the, the maps themselves are, you know, it, it's, you, you can get them all, you can get them in one subject, right? Very easily, as Peter said, even, you know, for these resting connectivity studies or other kinds of studies, you, you, it's very, very robust, right? And so, um, and it's not reflective of simple um, macroscopic anatomy. There's something, you know, it's modulating with, with, with function, it's modulating with task, et, et cetera. So, you know, I, I think one of the challenges we have here is that fMRI is trying to do a lot of things with a lot of unknowns all at the same time. So, so so we're, it, it's a macro level, right? So, so we're, not, we're not at cells, anywhere, anywhere close to cells, right? So the, the early joke was, it's, it's kind of like putting your hand on the hood of a car and measuring the temperature and, and trying to say something about the engine in the car, right? Um, and um, we also have a lot of techni technical developments in terms of the, the methodology to, to collect the scans. I mean, Peter remembers the early days of trying to get fMRI scanners to do fMRI, right? That was really hard uh, early on and, and, and now it's kind of caught up, but, but there's still more coming. And then we have all of the sort of algorithmic side, right? So it's this very complex spatial temporal signal and, and, and there's a lot of pieces in there and, and we're still figuring out 
you know, which pieces are relevant, which pieces are not relevant and under which context, you know, uh, those are useful. And so there's a lot of stuff to sort out here, right? So I, I would I would grant you that, I think, in, in the context of uh, how do, you know, we still have a lot to learn, right, in this field. Yeah, yeah, of course. I, I mean, I, I, I'm fully aware of the um, additional information that fMRI brings to um, understanding how brain areas can be reconfigured. And in fact, that's an interest I've had, so, you know, starting with, a, I had a PhD student called Thomas Acom who, who started this work in my laboratory and we, we published a number of papers on, on uh, oscillatory coherence. How, but it was a very much a bottom up approach of asking mm -hmm. how could this challenge be met by, um, you know, how, how one could reconfigure uh, connectivity, we have a, a, a structural connectome, but then you have to have the ability to reconfigure a functional connectome, and we approached it from a bottom-up perspective. Uh, so, but of course, you know, that always still, still makes assumptions of, of modules, um, and that sort of, um, I think, I, I was listening to, to Daniel Bassett, I think, she, she was speaking recently, and she made this interesting point about about the sort of network approach not necessarily being suited to some processes such as, I can't remember if it was ocean, ocean currents or meteorological phenomena. And I thought that's a very interesting point. You know, if, if you, you know how, how justified is it to go from the sort of modular approach? And of course we have 150 years of lesion studies mapping function of the brain areas, but, but you know, how appropriate is it to take the, the, the assumption that, that a sort of an area of bold signal uh, that we know correlates to some area of, of uh, you know, a modular area of sensory or motor cortex has the same meaning when you go into higher order, you know, sort of association areas, uh, that, that it has the same sort of meaning in terms of a module of some sort of process, some sort of computation uh, mm -hmm. that, 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 that is performed by that module. Uh, it's a reasonable assumption. I mean, it seems a very, very, you know, very compelling assumption. But I, but I just wonder if there's a, like a ground truth. That is, is it a falsifiable assumption? If it's not I, falsifiable, then you sort of ask yourself, oh, where are we? Are we on thin ice? Well, I, I believe it's testable. I mean, it's testable by uh, behavior and uh, testable by, you know, triangulating across other modalities, I, I guess, and also in animal studies as well. Um, uh, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, we and that's sort of what Vince was saying. It's like all this, all, what we're doing is sort of pushing the technology and trying to test it at the same time uh, in, in some regard. But um, I'm not sure exactly, right. I mean, so there's been a lot of work. I mean, most of the work now in FMRI is beyond the, the primary motor and visual and auditory cortex. It's, it's definitely trying to look at um, uh, connectivity changes uh, and, and meaningful differences in connectivity changes in prefrontal, parietal, uh, regions uh, to, you know, you can, you can have a whole laundry list of cognitive functions that they've been associated with. And, and, um, and it's repeatable enough that they can associate these things at a group level and, and to some degree at an individual level. That's, that's what we're going towards. One, um, yeah, so I don't know if that addressed, I'm not sure of your source of uncertainty as to why, and, and yes, there's certainly heterogeneity within those regions. Like, and it just brought to mind really, really quickly, uh, a nice sort of approach that caught on and, and maybe died down recently, um, Kalanit Grill Spectre, uh, looking at fMRI adaptation. So you're looking at a large areas, you know, parcels that are several millimeters or centimeter large. And, and what you do is you, you give a certain stimulus that causes neurons within that area to habituate. Uh, and so only a fraction of the neurons habituate, uh, other ones still keep on firing just as they want. And then you can actually look at the modulation of the fMRI signal to, to see the modulation of those, that subpopulation of neurons, which is a nice way of kind of not really getting the higher spatial resolution, but probing at a higher spatial resolution, this heterogeneity of neurons. So that there's all, all you know, the field is filled with, with sort of clever approaches like that, that, that sort of try to try to get at the underlying uh, neuron activity mm -hmm. without without making too many assumptions yeah that, that, that is that is interesting um, uh, but uh, can I just come back to something you mentioned just a moment ago I think you said something about you know areas of prefrontal cortex having different functions ascribed to them I mean am I not right to think that sometimes there's an embarrassingly large number of functions as ascribed to the same area uh, and that and that's still a sort of um, 
it's a sort of a, a, a boxology approach where you have a, a, an area doing a function. Uh, whereas, of course, there's the null hypothesis that the function is performed by a distributed network that may span many areas of the brain. And so it may be a, a quixotic yeah. Yeah. You know, journey to try to ascribe a function to an area. Uh, but anyway, no, that's a very ancient. Yeah, debate. no, that that, and there, I think what was it a, a couple years ago? They, it was like cingulate gate, right? So, so there was this uh, all these discussions about the cingulate cortex and what it does, right? And, and um, it was basically doing everything, right? So, so, um, so I think yeah, we have you have to be careful. There's the the the, the concept of reverse inference, which which can happen in, in studies where you basically say. There's another study and they found this function was linked with that area and I have that area in my study, therefore that area is, in my, is doing that function in my study, but that obviously wasn't directly tested. That's just, you know, kind of uh, making a, um, a loose association, not really a scientific, uh, it's not really scientific evidence per se, directly. That's a great example of bad studies in fMRI. I mean, there's, yeah. Russ yeah. Poldrak sort of called that out several years ago, uh, mm -hmm. that there has been, it was, was starting to be a growth of those studies. And he's like, now you can't, you can't make that reverse inference, but. Right, right. Uh, I, I, and I would, I would say also, you know, I, I think in terms of just network approaches, I mean, I think the, the, the other thing that I, I, I think has been a reason for why fMRI has kind of started to take off and even even continue to grow in the connectivity domain is because so you know the difference between fMRI and I think we can kind of it's informative to compare it to other modalities that have gained more traction in the clinical space right so structural MRI looking at tumors or CT right um, so CT has a real world unit right and and um, fMRI it's kind of a relative measure and relative it's it's not just the MRI signal, which is, you know, obviously a weighted signal uh, of, of multiple things, but it's a difference between those, you know, weighted signals. So, so it's, it's two degrees kind of or more removed. Um, but with at least with like kind of functional connectivity studies, and, and you, you know, there are, you can take issue with the word connectivity. It's, it's really coherence. Um, uh, you at least have a normalized signal. Right, so, so you're, you're getting at something that you can start to compare, and you can scale it up and start to look at larger, you know, larger studies. So that's, I think, you know, been been really a useful and informative um, benefit. Um, and I think the other piece is that um, I totally agree that that like network-based approaches and uh, module-based approaches are um, not necessarily always informative and. You know, we've been looking, for example, at what we, we sort of frame it as sort of network aware and network naive, you know, kinds of approaches where we sort of look at the entire brain in, in, in more of a, you know, like looking at waves, looking at, you know, different, you know, kinds of uh, approaches uh, to it. So it's, it's not, you know, sort of a unitary approach. There's, there's a whole bunch of different approaches and some are better than others and some are better in certain contexts than others. And I do think the field in general has a hard time making those distinctions, I would say. And so things kind of get grouped together and there's another paper that comes out and another paper that comes out on these things. And it's, in some cases, it isn't particularly well thought out, right? In terms of what is, why this, what's the rationale, so. Yeah. Yeah. Can I, can I sort of jump into, uh, I mean, I think we, but I'm not sure if we're gonna advance the conversation a bit sort of too rapidly, but, um, the sort of dynamic functional connectivity, the sort of changes in configurations, mm. uh, typically in these sort of resting state protocols, uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, and a lot of these changes take place sort of pretty close to the, the sort of the Nyquist frequency for the acquisition, if you see what I mean. You know, you have a sort of, you know, they're taking place at a frequency of about 0 0.1 hertz. And that's roughly where your cutoff is, you know, because you can't really go much faster than that. So, so there's two ways of going forward. You know, either that is the relevant frequency at which these reconfigurations take place, and they have some relevance to conscious or subconscious processing, uh, or or some important physiological regulation or you're just looking at the tail end of a hidden distribution at, where most of the work is actually taking place at a higher frequency, but it's invisible to your method. 
I'm just wondering how, how you guys feel yeah, about that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the, so the, the, I guess there's, there's different, um, different aspects to that question. One of which is the acquisition, the Nyquist frequency of the acquisition, right? So I think it's pretty clear that we are, um, I mean, you, you can sample now from the whole brain, you know, at, you know, 300 milliseconds, right? Or 350 milliseconds or so. Um, and so the Nyquist frequency kind of goes way up beyond 0.1 Hertz. And, and you still see a lot of power at that, at that frequency range. It's not only at 0.1 Hertz. And one of my critiques of the resting fMRI field is that everybody filters out everything above 0.1, right? And there's a lot of information above that, right? And there's some studies that are coming out to kind of talk about this. And I think the, the other piece of this is that the hemodynamic response, you know, is, you know, you, if you model that as sort of a point spread, a temporal point spread function, um, it's filtering the signal down and, and it is kind of, it's kind of centering it in that range, right? Given what we know about, at least if we, if we do basic experiments, the, the timing. Um, but that being said, there's also, uh, it's, not, it's not a monolithic um, uh, uh, point spread function, right? And there are higher frequency components to it that we can start to tease apart. And so I, I think, um, I don't think that um, the point one is an artifact of the acquisition at all. I think it, it could be related to the fact that we're sort of in this hemodynamic range. And I totally agree with fMRI, especially when you're doing whole brain fMRI, you're, you're doing a lot of integration, right? So, so there is uh, multiple, there are multiple, you know, communications that happen uh, between these regions by the time you've gotten that signal, right? And, and then the hemodynamics have come down. So that, that's another piece where sort of trying to get at some more causal studies or, you know, tying it to higher frequency electrophysiologic studies is needed to help us tease it apart. But it also doesn't mean that that macro level signal doesn't contain a lot of useful information at that different scale, right? So again, you know, looking at multiple scales is really useful and isn't done enough. And you can do that in fMRI. You can also do it in electrophys, and you can start to link, you know, try to link those together. So. Yeah. As a matter of fact, there is a, a really nice work. I, I think. Well, you know, Vince, you do, you know, you do that as well. But it, but okay. I just saw a recent paper by or a recent talk by Mark Woolrich. At, at Cambridge actually doing MEG and EEG with fMRI and actually looking, using hidden Markov modeling to sort of probe the dynamics and actually finding a, uh, yeah, I mean, it, something we've always known that the fMRI shows this slow uh, changes in connectivity uh, that's limited by the hemodynamic response. Yeah, I don't think it has anything to do with the acquisition limits. Uh, you, can, uh, you can sample faster yeah. than the hemodynamic response. But what Mark showed is that uh, if you do this with uh, uh, more electrophysiologic measures, yes, you get many more rapid transitions, but the pattern is pretty much the same, and the and the and the way they the 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 the, the reconfigurations are are similar to with fMRI. And so, um, yeah, I mean, fMRI, I, it, I'm sure there's a continuum of uh, yeah. of manifestation of power, uh, and and fMRI just sees a little bit of that, but enough. Um, and then we're probably missing a lot, but yeah, so. I mean, it, it, you know, we, and I, yeah, I agree. I mean, it, we, we've done some studies, as you know, of like concurrent EEG fMRI, right. And looked at the dynamic uh, connectivity configurations and, and the like, and, and, and it's pretty clear that there's a strong relationship uh, there, but, but you can also play games again with, a lot, you know, you can do, you can do simulations, right. You can simulate these different scales, right. And you can start to see, you know, um, uh, I mean, things look, quite different if you look at a different scale, right? And you're integrating over. So like you said, uh, Dimitri, if you have this sparse spread, uh, you know, of, of firing neurons uh, versus, a, you know, sort of a dense homogeneous uh, region, but your, your, your spatial scale is broad and there's a lot of smoothing that's occurring, those are gonna start to get blurred together, right? And it, it will look like a homogeneous, you're not gonna be able to tease apart, you know, this, this you know, the interdigitation or, 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 or the like. So. Again, you're, you're dealing with the data you have at the scale that you're looking at or at the scale that you've chosen to analyze it uh, at. And so that context is really important. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we all agree it's, it's, it's a fascinating high dimensional world. And, uh, um, and, and there's this 
explosion of hypotheses that one can then probe. Uh, and as a rather old fashioned sort of um, uh, hypothesis driven scientist, uh, I sometimes despair at the, the conclusions I read of papers that are studying resting state fMRI, uh, you know, concluding that, you know, there's greater or lower between the centrality or some change in anti-correlated connectivity between different networks and so on. And I, I, I never know what's good, what should, you know, in these groups of patients with a disease uh, uh, compared to controls, when they have one or other of these changes in, in metrics obtained from graph theory, what's good and what's yeah. bad. Sometimes it's a bit worrying because, because the next sentence concludes that this must be some compensatory effect. So I'm just wondering, <laughs> you know, what, what, what's, the, what's the null hypothesis? What sh what's the optimal level of between the centrality or, or eigenvector stability that we should all strive for? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, just to, uh, yeah, right now fMRI is sort of in the state of, you know, one, we're, 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 we're sort of trying to figure out, I mean, right now the field is, you know, there have been many clinical studies of populations, and you see population differences. And 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 you're absolutely right. I mean, an example of a, of not the best study is sort of like you 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 compare different groups, you see a difference, and then you sort of have a just so, so story to sort of explain it. That's not really that's not as good as it can be. Um, uh, if you have, if, if you sort of try to triangulate with other methods or other, uh, and you start with an hypothesis as to what should happen, that's much better. But still, the reality is, is that there is uh, still enough variability uh, in the connectivity patterns and enough variability um, between subjects, between days, uh, that we're finding, uh, you know, there's, I think the field's at a state where we can't just do these n of a hundred subject uh, studies. We need, we need you know the Oxford uh, you know the the the, the database uh, of thousands and thousands to to try to pull out differences to potentially use as biomarkers. That may not be the answer either. Um, so we're at the stage where we're trying to get a handle of the reproducibility of the networks, and and we're trying to boost up the effect size, uh, which would be better, and and then. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I would go further and say, I mean, um, I guess make the point that um, th there's this sort of, um, again, it's a spectrum. There's a lot of spectra here, right? So there's a spectrum between group level studies and individualized studies, right? Um, and, and it's sort of a cycle, right? Or a circle, right? And I think we need to go back and forth between them. And if we really are going to, um, you know, if, if fMRI is going to make an impact clinically, it needs to be single you know, at, at the level of, of a, you know, one individual subject, right? And, and there are a lot of studies, you know, th that have been showing um, uh, useful um, uh, and, and clinically relevant information um, in um, single subjects, right? So, so there's, you know, but sometimes it's, it's related to, um, you know, like, I, I think there's, a, there's some advancement now in, in the field in, in sort of trying to predict for example, cognitive decline, right, in, in, in um, uh, subsequent cognitive decline, or, or predict sort of biomarker validated decline, right, so you kind of have like a CSF marker, uh, for example. Um, other studies have looked at sort of multivariate, you know, kind of prediction of things like pain, pain signatures, uh, and, and the like. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we've done a lot of work, you know, and, and this is, you know, I think there's also something to be said for recognizing the fact that we, we have, you know, uh, fMRI in a sense is kind of trying to chase its tail because, because it's sort of trying to be applied in many cases to disorders that don't have um, a mechanism underlying them. At least we don't know yet, right? Or they're very complex. There's a lot of studies. I mean, we do a lot of work with mental disorders and, and the like. Um, in, in, in the, obviously neurology, um, neurological disorders and, and diseases, it becomes you know, you at least have something, you know, to, to validate, right, to try to validate against. Um, and so I think that's another important thing is that, you know, you're, it, you're trying to study something that isn't well defined in, in, in a lot of cases. Uh, and your ground truth isn't really 
a good ground truth. Um, and, and so that's another, I think, another piece that's kind of muddied the waters in, in, in terms of, of fMRI. But I, I think there's also been some advances there. So Yeah, and I think an important point here is that, uh, you know, other fields, right, if you have mouse studies and or, or animal studies, you can actually say, oh, well, there's, you know, if you block the calcium channels or if you do, if there's a mechanistic mm -hmm. start, and then you can say, oh, well, this, this might be associated with this disorder. And you can actually draw the connection. With fMRI, you have activation patterns and networks uh, not exactly uh, lining up and we don't know why and and we don't know how and and it's sort of it's at the there's a there's, there's a limit to the depth in which we can interpret fundamentally what the, what it means and that's why you know work by Danny Bassett or modeling the fMRI response you know trying to make a mechanistic explanation at that level uh, is also useful I mean I, I push people all the time you know that you have to go beyond having fMRI as just cartography and, uh, and, and get into more mechanisms. But, uh, uh, you know, also uh, at the same time, uh, uh, I think that, you know, we don't know, you know, it, it, right. I mean, we don't know if, if we're, we're trying to derive principles of brain function, you know, it's, there's probably principles at all different scales. And, and fMRI, there's, there might be principles to be derived at that scale as well. Um, you know, uh, I also like to bring the, you know, we haven't yet come up with also, and also the clinical manifestations uh, of disorders might be at the scale of, of the fMRI signal as opposed to the single neuron scale. I, I don't know that, but there might be different disorders for which, wh whichever. So that's why you need them all in some sense. So, yeah, oh, yes. I mean, I, 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 I think the disorders of brain communication, I, I mean, one can call them functional disorders, except in neurology, functional disorders has a different meaning. But anyway, we can call them functional disorders in the sense that they are disorders not of the fundamental structure, or there may be some subtle structural alterations, but the disor disorders where is the abnormality of the information transmission or signals, signal, signal transmission through the brain, which is, which is at, at the core of the disease, I think those, those are the disorders for which fMRI, of course, holds out the greatest promise, except, of course, sometimes we don't have a ground truth. We don't have a way of, of validating this. Epilepsy, I sort of think, is, is in a sweet spot because, of course, we've got the EEG, and we know that epilepsy, of course, it, you know, epilepsy is a collection of diseases. Um, you know, we know that in epilepsy, you, you, you haven't got, usually, you haven't got very big lesions, structural lesions, but these are abnormalities of flow of signals through the brain. Um, I suppose you could argue that, you know, because we have the luxury of the EEG and electrocorticogram and, and, and depth EEG and, and uh, um, uh, intracranial, uh, other types of intracranial recordings, uh, we know an enormous amount about, about seizures. And so the added value of fMRI has been pretty modest. We, don't, we haven't really learned that very much about how seizures happen from fMRI. fMRI, of course, has a role in pre-surgical planning because of the ability to, you know, to localize um, motor strip and lateralized language and so on. Uh, and then I suppose, you know, even one step closer to the hemodynamic response, migraine, uh, where you've got, you know, people with aura, you have this, uh, this massive um, uh, neurovascular phenomenon that you can pick up with fMRI. Uh, that's in a way, uh, in, in, in a perfect spot, because it's, you know, we think that the spreading depression probably is very, very closely related to the process that gives rise to the bolt signal. Right. But of course, if you go into the other direction and go into something like schizophrenia, yeah, yeah, you end up with that sort of, um, you know, sort of slightly nebulous area of, of not knowing how to test hypotheses. What is the ground truth? Uh, and of course, again, you know, just as seizures can be generated from numerous different processes, the different components of, of schizophrenia, the sort of the different uh, first rank symptoms probably can arise through different mechanisms. And indeed, I'm not a psychiatrist, but a few patients with, with schizophrenia who have, um, I have come across, you know, every one of them is different. Um, and, and so it's not a unitary disease. It's not, it's not a homogeneous disease that one can really um, approach with such, uh, so much confidence that one, one's going to get an answer from the fMRI. But, but, but it's, it, yeah, until we have alternative methods, you know, I'm not sure that Meg is really going to be the, uh, is going to displace fMRI. It's, it's still generating an enormous amount of material I mean, to try to understand. 
Yeah, I, I think there's, um, I think there are some domains, I, I agree, and, 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 but I think there are some domains which are a little better defined um, than at least trying to target, you know, brain disorders, which would be um, looking at things like um, predicting response to medication, right? Sort of looking at longitudinal studies in cases where the medication will impact the prognosis, right, uh, uh, of an individual or, or trying to uh, look at subtypes, right? Or even, um, this is a little bit more challenging, but this is more of a research question, but trying to sort of see if we can use the, 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 the brain data to, to help inform the nosiological categories, right? Uh, you know, so so they're, they're, they're not based necessarily on anything biological, right? Um, and, and so, um, but they're useful. Right. So, so, so to what degree do those things, you know, overlap and are convergent? And so I think there's a lot of interesting work ongoing in that space. Um, and I think that I, there are some, there are a number of examples where fMRI looks to be promising for sort of prediction, you know, type, type studies. And so that's, again, that's an easy, easier question, right? I'm just trying to, I'm taking a bunch of data, I'm throwing it in, I'm trying to, and I know what I want to predict, right? So you have an answer. It's clear. Uh, what it is, it's not based on, you know, uh, you know, uh, diagnostic categories necessarily that are, that are poorly defined. And you can, you can, and if it's, if it's, if the prediction accuracy is high enough and it has a high enough impact on these individual patients, then that can be, uh, you know, that I think there's going to be some of those types of studies that will, that will emerge as well. Um, yeah, and but I just yeah, wanted, there's, but there's a lot going on. Yeah, so I just want to bring out one quick point too: is that um, you know part of the reason why uh, potentially we don't have uh, you know clear correspondence to let's say diagnostic criteria of schizophrenia or whatever is just because of the fact that um, you know we're I think that what we're finding is that we need to potentially guide those criteria with with the brain imaging results. I mean, it seems like that might help sort. Uh, the diagnosis, uh, looking at the brain imaging results itself, so themselves. So there might be different types of schizophrenia. There might be different types of depression uh, that that involve you know disordered networks in in different ways. And right now we just lump them into a criteria, diagnostic criteria, and hope that they settle in. But if they're not, that I think that's not necessarily it's too it's too premature to jump to saying fMRI, there's something wrong with fMRI, but more potentially that there's, there's the story is more complicated than we thought. And that if we try to sort these, these groups based on how they sort of sort out, yeah. and then we might be able to come up with different differential di uh, diagnoses in that sense. That's the whole RDOC uh, push at the NIH, at least, to try to have these more brain measures of, of these psychiatric disorders. Yes, I mean, uh, 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 fMRI is a sort of endophenotype or as a, as a I mean, because the whole biomarker field requires a lot of um, painstaking replication in real world scenarios, you know, not just the sort of the people who volunteer to be scanned, but actual, actually going out there in primary care settings and recruiting patients and then seeing, seeing how these biomarkers pan out. And, if, and also, of course, then demonstrating clinical utility. Is there evidence that if you stratify or or, or, or then correlate certain outcomes or certain results to, um, to response to various treatments that is actually going to have an, an impact and then can then just be justified as, uh, as, as an additional step. I mean, it'd be fantastic if, if one could sort of reach for the request form and just say, please do an fMRI on this patient. <laughs> We're still some way off. I mean, we can, still, we can do that for, for very, very narrow indications, but, but it's, it's still not just around the corner. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, uh, yeah, there's a long way to go. And, and honestly, I, I, it's not clear. I mean, certainly fMRI has lent itself a little bit more to neurologic disorders that are a little bit more tractable and uh, uh, psychiatric disorders. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's definitely not low hanging fruit, uh, trying to get at biomarkers related to psychiatric disorders. Um, yeah, and I mean, I, I think that's, I would say that's not, a problem with fMRI. That's a problem <laughs> with with the categorization, how we, uh, in studying the disorder. So that, that's kind of a category where I I believe fMRI can be really useful and informative, right? But yes, but a, 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 right? as a neurologist, I yeah. don't, you know, I, I I can't see that many places where fMRI is a validated tool to help 
with uh, diagnosis, prognosis, stratification, or navigation for, for targeted interventions. I mean, there are a few indications, mm -hmm. uh, but, 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 but it hasn't sort of panned out and I, I can't see it taking over. Well, uh, well there's one, one nice example. I, I interviewed uh, Michael Fox who does, you know, basically looking at lesions and looking at uh, neurologic or even psychiatric disorders and finding, you know, the lesions were all over the place and, uh, you know, trying to find some sort of unity to this. And they, he started to look at fMRI uh, functional networks. And to the extent the lesions lie on these networks, the diagnoses are similar in that regard. So it's a way of potentially unifying lesion studies in that regards to put them into a framework of networks. Uh, that yeah, that, 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 that's more to do with mechanisms, which of course are fascinating. And indeed, uh, there was a very interesting paper from Bill Seeley and his colleagues at UCSF a few years ago, but lo looking at different neurodegenerative conditions and, and arguing that the, the, the connectome, the functional connectome, um, gives some prediction as to how the different uh, networks would be uh, would be affected and how, how disease progression happens in these different uh, diagnostic categories. Uh, so that's fascinating from a point of view of, of mechanisms, but, but as far as clinical utility, so when, when will we get to the stage where at the individual patient level, it will be useful to get uh, resting state functional conductivity measures or, or whatever uh, is difficult to see. Yeah, and I, I think um, obviously you'd, you'd already mentioned the the, um, the sort of pre-surgical mapping one, but there's also some like functional connectivity studies of sort of tumor aggression and impact on other uh, behavioral um, uh, uh, metrics. Um, but the I guess I'll just kind of identify what I think is sort of another um, challenge to the field, which is that so because fMRI does require a lot of, you know, sort of domain knowledge, right, to, to, to work with it, um, there's a lot of choices to be made, there's a lot of methods, you know, to, to choose from, um, there's, a, there's a bit of a gap between clinically relevant questions being asked and people that do the analysis, right, and so, so those, those, those worlds only overlap a little bit, and so I, I kind of feel, you know, like the, it, it's not that fMRI has tried and failed in a lot of cases. It's that it's never been tried on it. Like, I mean, if you do another study of X versus Y, um, it, you know, in, in a poorly defined space, it's, it's okay, you got a result, but it's, it's, it's not gonna have an impact because it's not a relevant clinical question, right? And so that's, that I think would be, you know, th th there, there needs to be more studies that are, that are targeted at asking questions that are going to have relevance clinically. And, and, and I, I think there's a paucity of that at the moment. There's some, but there's not, not a lot. So, but there's a lot more that could be. Yeah. Now, obviously I haven't read all 65,000 papers on, on, a, on fMRI, but, but, you know, from my myopic perspective of, uh, as editor of Brain until the end of last year, uh, you know, th there was a very interesting paper, which sort of questions the utility of fMRI in the sense that uh, this is a paper by Sal Bellagio et al. Uh, um, Michael T. and uh, and um, we're also uh, authors on that, and and compare the utility of the functional connectome and the structural connectome in predicting the the the, the deficits following strokes, uh, and I think they concluded, if I understand correctly, that the functional connectome um, wasn't particularly useful. I mean, if the functional connectivity in an individual patient was useful in predicting the outcome, the, the, the deficit, but of course that's that's obvious. But but they they argued that the structural connectome outperformed the functional connectome. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there've been a few sort of letters uh, to Brain yeah. since then, yeah. but it's it's slightly slightly challenged that that high, that assumption. Of course, you know, this is just one paper, and I can see that stroke is a very is a very messy field because lesions are never really quite so discrete. There are a lot of subcortical strokes, and and lesion burdens often. Uh, sort of not revealed by by standard uh, imaging, but anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think also the the um, uh, it, I guess I, I would I would agree. I, I, I think and, and there may well be cases where fMRI doesn't perform as well, right? It's just it's a technique, right, of, of many possible ones. Um, but but I also think in in part, g given all of the methodological choices and differences, I, I you know I, I think I think there. 
you know, I think more recently we're starting to see studies where like interclass correlation coefficients and things like that are, are starting to go up, right? Um, and um, that's largely in the context of it, it's not very good in task, you know, unfortunately. And I think that's, you know, task-based studies in, in part because of the fact that we don't have uh, quantitative units uh, on, on the signal um, and the, it's not normalized, right, in, in, in any way necessarily. Um, but I think that in, in other studies of like uh, resting connectivity and, and the like, you are seeing, you know, ICCs going up, you know, at or above like 0.7 and, and higher. And that's getting kind of at least in the potential range, right, of, of, of being, uh, being useful. And, and you're seeing you know, certain act levels of, of predictive accuracy that are sort of getting high now. Um, again, if, if, if you're going to do this in, in you know, I, I would argue it, it's going to be informative to look at large end studies, right, to kind of, you know, it's to the degree that the models are complex and we want to train and we want to make sure they work. Um, but I, I think, again, anything we do, if it's going to be clinically relevant, has to work in one individual subject reliably and, and well. So, um, so if there's something, if we're looking at it the right way, you know, that will fall out if it's, if it's, you know, if it's there, right? So, yeah, we're, we're working very hard on, on, and, I, and actually it's, the answer is not clear. Uh, we're working very hard on, you know, increasing the effect size. So you don't need these, these massive end studies, uh, you know, and to increase the effect size, you know, you have to increase the fidelity of the signal, but also maybe trying to parse, uh, what you're looking for uh, a little bit better, uh, group your subjects better. I, you know, it's hard to say. But in, once again, it's not necessarily a criticism of the field. I mean, the field is actually, it's interesting. I mean, it's, it continues to sort of progress forward. And, it, and as we go along, we sort of get a better idea of what its limits are. And we're, we're also continuously surprised at kind of what it might inform, but we, it's not clear enough. And so, yeah, it, it's such a, you know, it's a flashy technique. You have these brain maps. And, and because of that, there's, lot of uh, there's a lot of room for bad studies there's a lot of room for misinterpretation and and doing crazy not very good things with it but at the same time it's a it's a it's a measure uh that that we're still trying to understand uh not only what it's related to but it's but how well and how with high with, with what fidelity it correlates with disorders and so i mean there's this recent paper that just came by my desk that i forwarded to you by sanji kim showing you know uh, a really nice study showing, you know, uh, different activation with uh, uh, excitation versus inhibition, which is, you know, classic sort of, you know, like you see a difference, you don't exactly know why, you don't know exactly what's going on, but you see something. And so there's, it's a super sensitive signal to things that might be there, but, um, and we have to sort of, you know, obviously then do the groundwork to, to further establish that sort of things as a, as a method. It's, yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I guess one other comment too is that the again the, the dynamics are really interesting. You know, I, I think I would agree with that, and, and it's one of the things we focused on a lot in, in, in my group. And um, but things are changing not only temporally but also spatially, right? Uh, over time, and and so you know we have to kind of try to figure out how to model that well. Right. Um, and uh, I think there's been a lot of advancement, you know, in particular in the past, you know, 10 years or so in that in that space. Um, and um, you, you look at a lot of the studies of, of functional connectivity or just look are, are sort of averaging the data together, but it's a functional signal. Right. And so and it, in particular, if you're doing a resting study, it's, it's a poorly defined uh, task. Right. And um, so there, it really makes much more sense to, to model that in, in a more dynamic way so you can capture the transient, you know, the transient information. So, so I think that's, I think that's gonna, gonna uh, be really informative as, as we go forward in terms of, again, potential metrics that can be evaluated in the context of clinical questions. Right? Yeah, I mean, I can see that sort of capturing the dynamics uh, a bit like understanding turbulent flow is, mm -hmm. is, is a scientific advance in its own right. Um, but coming back to the individual patient or the individual subject, uh, uh, it, it would still be very important to have clear hypotheses. And I get the impression mm -hmm. that for the, for, you know, when you're dealing with such high, high dimensional data, 
you know, pinning down the number of degrees of freedom is just extremely difficult. It'd be really nice if there was some sort of, you know, some convention on this is it. And then possibly some sort of registered reports, you know, those, those, uh, those papers where you, you say, this is my methodology, this is the hypothesis I'm going to test. You register it, you seal it like a clinical trial protocol, boom. And then you do the experiment and then you publish it and you don't change your hypothesis halfway yep. through. Yep. Which I, I, I may be misrepresenting the field, but sometimes when I see those, those sort of slightly just so stories at the end of the, mm -hmm. at the end of the abstract, I raise my yeah. hand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. I think there's a lot of those out there and um, the, 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 it's, it's made worse by the fact that there's so many choices to be made. Right. And so, um, you know, P hacking, et cetera, right. Is, is very easy and it's easy to inadvertently do as well. Right. As careful as you try to be, right. It's um, it can be uh, you, you could still find out later. Oops. You know, I, there was some, there was some circularity there that I didn't consider. Right. And so I think those kinds of things, you know, I, I, I tell this story a, a lot that, you know, I, I, I see this quite a lot with my students where they get started on fMRI and then, then they'll come and they'll be really excited because they've got this really high predictive accuracy of something, right? And then, you know, ask some questions and they'll go back and continue to kind of analyze it. And then they'll come back later and they'll be like, you know, I just lost everything. It's not doing it. It's not performing well because I was, I was using this information to do the analysis. That's why it was so good, right? But I didn't know that. So I shouldn't have used it, right? So, so you know, I think, I think it's, you know, it's one of the reasons, I think one of the things we're trying to, encourage more of our, our the obviously data sharing, but also competitions and things like that, right? So you kind of, you define a question, you put some data up and you, you define again, like a registered report in a sense, right? You're defining a question ahead of time and then everybody's kind of competing, right? To try to, to see how well they do. And then the evaluation's done on data that they never saw, right? At, right. at the end. And so that I think is one way to try to help get at generalizable results that, that will, um, you know, that will persist, right? As, as opposed to, again, you, you can have the best group in the world doing something and they might make, you know, they might get something that is a little bit more only in their hands gonna work, right? And, and it's not because they're, they're doing something really special, it's just because something had, had, you know, was a little bit circular that wasn't, you know, considered. It's easy, it's just really easy to do, so. Yeah, so, um, and, and you're right. I mean, I think that, uh, that uh, um, the field right now, I mean, the statisticians, the, the, the people who are data, the data scientists are, I mean, they're, they're sort of playing a better role in, in terms of uh, playing a more significant role in terms of how we, how we handle this, because it's very clear, uh, just as Vince said, and, and you know, some, some extremely skilled experimenter who's not doing anything wrong, who's doing everything, everything right, but uh, it's hard to sometimes reproduce those results. Uh, and and um, you know, the, the signal is variable, the signal's rich, uh, which on one hand makes it really difficult uh, to properly interpret, but on the other hand, it's a huge amount of opportunity to sort of for those people parsing it out a little bit further and who are a little bit more systematic. So um, yeah, I would, I would argue it, it, we're still trying to figure ourselves out. I mean, fMRI has a place. And, and as I said before, I mean, it's very easy to do just so studies, uh, get them published. It's harder to get those published. Uh, the field's sort of ratcheting up a little bit. Um, but at the same time, there are more hypothesis driven studies um, there's a little bit more sophistication in terms of how people go about asking these questions, a little bit more trying to do multimodal analysis and really more of an eye on the ball of what the goal is, not just to make uh, you know nice maps of the brain and say, look, there's a nice map of the brain, but really either to understand uh, the brain, uh, you know, maybe try to derive principles of brain organization, at least at the scale we can. And two, you know, I think in the last maybe even five years, the, the whole idea of let's get clinical traction on this uh, has just really started up. Um, you know, really trying to, you know, not only develop biomarkers, but even the low hanging fruit. What, what I look at as low hanging fruit is, you know, from resting state, you can derive measures of uh, 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 neurovascular coupling or, uh, or, or flow in the brain, just looking at the latency of the global signal 
and things like that that might be useful clinically, maybe even more useful than them coming up with biomarkers of schizophrenia um, or, or whatever. So, you know, we're, it's, 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 a, it's after 30 years, we're still debating things like how do you best eliminate veins and, 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 but there's still tons of progress. And I think it's made mostly through the multimodal uh, uh, integration, um, people stepping back and really assessing the statistics a little bit better. Um, and also the creative people who actually look at other aspects of the signal, like the latency, the width, the, the undershoots, which all might contain useful physiologic information uh, that we're still in the process of looking for. So well, you, you say it's more difficult to publish, but Brain still welcomes. Uh, I, I just checked with the, the new editor, Masood Hussain. He's still going to welcome papers on fMRI as long as they are relevant to neurology or translational neuroscience. Uh, and, and, and in fact, it's interesting. I mean, it, it, I had a look at the, the rate at which we were publishing papers on fMRI, and it's about 30 a year in Brain, and almost none in the sort of classical competitor journals, uh, uh, Annals of Neurology, uh, uh, um, JAMA Neurology, Lancet Neurology, almost never published on fMRI. And I don't know if it's because brain is slightly different, it's slightly more scientific than, than those other journals, which are a bit closer to the practice of neurology. Uh, and I had a quick look at the sort of citation rates and they're about average, but for, you know, if, you, if you look at the citation of average papers in brain, whether they have, um, and, so, and compare them to papers that have fMRI as part of the, uh, the methodology, um, they neither get cited more nor less than, 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 the, uh, than the overall average. So, um, so I, I think fMRI is going to continue being a, an important part of, uh, of what Brain publishes, and so I'd encourage people to consider the journal. Okay. okay. I, I would um, encourage, I would encourage um, researchers getting into to the field to, to start to target clinically relevant questions and well-defined, you know, just survey what's out there, right? We need people to more, do more integrative type, you know, surveys of, okay, there's like these million things, right? These are the ones that look promising. Fix them, let's test them, right? Because um, in, in some relevant questions, because I think a lot of, you see so many papers out there. And so I, since I come from more of an engineering background, I probably see more of this uh, than, than many where, oh, it's, it's a real cool mathematical approach, but there's no connection to application, an application of relevance at all, right? It's just like, oh, we did this and we threw this data at it and we got that, right? But the method's really cool. So there, we need more people, I think, that are really targeted at, you know, th there's enough out there now that we should be able to do this. And there aren't a ton of people that are really doing the work to push that forward, to get to a real biomarker. There's a bunch of things that have to be done, right? To, to, to get something validated, et cetera, and, or to see whether it's going to be relevant, you know, in terms of try it out, right? With a clinical collaborator, you know, who, who you can work with closely. So that would be my encouragement to the, to the field. Yeah. We're trying to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps a little bit more. And <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so is there anything, uh, you know, it's interesting. There's a, right now at the, this moment, there's a windstorm going out outside my house and I'm worried about the power going out. So I want to make sure this is recorded. <laughs> um, so, uh, but uh, we've certainly gone uh, uh, longer than we typically go. Uh, and I'm certainly mindful of your time as well. Um, is there anything else that um, uh, uh, you wanted to make sure you emphasized or anything to, you know, this could be, a, there could be a round two of this as well. This is a great discussion that we should have more of uh, uh, as we go along, but is there anything today that, uh, that, that you would be interested in, in just making a point of, or do you think that we've covered, we've covered a lot of ground, but. Um, I think we've covered a lot of ground. I, I mean, I've learned a lot, you know, I'm, I'm, as I say, I came into this a bit like a, a journalist, you know, trying to understand the issues as an outsider coming away with um, a greater understanding, a greater appreciation. Uh, I th I th it's been a, a learning uh, process for me. I'm very glad that you invited me to participate in this. Yeah. And well, I, I would say, I'd say as well, it's been, it's been really great to, to just hear your input um, and, and, and uh, thought process, right? And, 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 and it's very valuable. And I, I think this, this kind of a discussion is really, is really useful. Um, I think for, uh, for me and, and, and um, uh, for many in the field to really just take a hard look at what, what is, what are we doing, right? Is it, 
what, what are we doing that can be useful in, 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 in these ways and how do we think about that, right? So. Um, yeah, I, I think this sort of discussion really is valuable. Uh, and this, and having a perspective from, from those, you know, not sort of so much in the field is, is, is who are, you know, outstanding scientists who are using other modalities outside the field. It's really valuable, um, not only for us to evaluate ourselves, but for potential opportunities for, uh, you know, taking a different perspective and, and taking different directions potentially. So, uh, yeah, we're not always aware of, of what, our, what our gaps are and, and this is great. So thank you very much. And, and, and actually, uh, yeah, thanks for, you know, writing the editorial to, that, that, that uh, spurred this whole thing. Um, At least the two of us read it, right? So <laughs> yeah, the two of us read it. And then, and then we read it and we're like, then other, you know, obviously other people became aware of it. And, uh, um, and, and I think the value of it is, is definitely in the conversation that it catalyzed uh, uh, among a lot of people. And I, hopefully, you know, it will result in more. So, well, well, thank you. Yes, I was slightly worried that I'd be the little boy that says the emperor has no clothes, but, but no, on the contrary, the emperor has beautiful, colorful, perhaps too colorful clothes. Uh, uh, but we still have to make sure that the clothes are performing. He's overdressed. Function. Yeah. Are they keeping the emperor warm? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that they do their job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, well, thank you very much. Uh, and, and well, thank you. We do appreciate it. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks.